morning. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've made. We ask you to bless this gathering. We ask you to uh, teach us from your word today. We ask you to soften our hearts and open our ears. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we're going to continue our study of uh, Matthew chapters 1 through 12. Um, Last week, uh, Ricardo taught on John the Baptist and Jesus' baptism from chapter 3. Today we're going to cover the temptation of Jesus in chapter 4. And it goes like this. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of, the, Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, It is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give to you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death on them a light has dawned. From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the, and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Start with the temptation of Jesus. Um, Jesus had just been baptized by John, and he, and remember the verse there is, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. So now we have God the Father is in heaven. We have uh, uh, God the, the Son of God on earth in obedience and submission to the plan of, of salvation and, and obedience to God. And now we have the Holy Spirit of God resting on Jesus as evidence of God's stamp of approval and as the guide to the plan of salvation. So the first thing that the Spirit directed Jesus to do was go on a camping trip. <laughs> a pretty tough one. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's quite a camping trip. The original Greek word... Uh, for the wilderness, it means a rough and mountainous area that is sparsely settled, that does have some forest, but, but is best used as a, uh, as a pasture rather than for uh, farming or tilling. And if you look at this map, you can kind of see where the wilderness of, of, of Judah is um, in relationship to Jerusalem and Bethlehem and, and the hill country and Hebron there. Um, 
Anybody know the reason it was a, a wilderness? It got about 25% of the rain that the mountainous area did. And it's, a, it's an effect called rain shadow. And as the, as the winds are coming from the uh, west and blowing across the, the, the mountain areas, when they get to the mountain area, they tend to just drop up most of their rain. So that when they, the rain clouds get over this wilderness area, uh, there's not as much rain that, that falls there. It's a dry strip of land that runs alongside the, the Jordan River and the Dead Sea, and it receives, like I said, roughly a quarter of the total amount of rainfall that places like eastern Jerusalem have. Now he goes, he's led by the Spirit with, for a specific purpose, to be tempted by the devil. Let's talk a little bit about temptation. Uh, James 1.13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God, him, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So it's important to remember that the devil is the one doing the tempting. You can certainly call this a trial. And you can certainly call many of the things that we go through as, as humans a trial. But you can't say that we're being tempted by God. Let's find out how Christ was tempted. From Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Well, let's see what those aspects are. 1 John 2.16, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, some translations say the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the, is, but is from the world. So, he's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And 40 is something we're going to hear a lot. Um, Elijah also fasted that long, for instance. And in, uh, you can read that in, in 1 Kings 19, verse 8. Uh, Moses was also without food on, or drink on Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. The, uh, the, the, uh, the Israelites, or no, I'm sorry, Elijah also fasted that long. Uh, the, the Israelites in, uh, in, the, in the wilderness, uh, the 40 days co correspond to the 40 years of, of wandering. And these are just a few of the instances from Scripture. There are, there are many more. Uh, for instance, the rains, Noah's flood, 40 days, 40 nights. Israel ate manna, 40 years. Moses was with God on the mountain, 40 days. The spies searched the land of Canaan for 40 days. Saul reigned for 40 years. David reigned over Israel for 40 years. I don't have it on here, but Solomon reigned for 40 years. And Jesus remained on earth 40 days after the resurrection. Now, does it, is it have any significance? Not really. Not that I could find. It just, 40 seems to be a, a, a number that, uh, that the Lord uses a lot. And the tempter came to him and said, and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Which, uh, the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, which one of these do you think this falls into? This is lust of the flesh. This is Satan trying to, to, to use Jesus' hunger. Obviously, he's hungry by now, you would think, as uh, a temptation. And Jesus answers, man shall not live by bread, bread alone. And this is a scripture. Um, it's important to remember the conditional if here carries the meaning of since. So, since you are the Son of God. Satan had no doubt in his mind that Jesus was the Son of God. Uh, he knows it all too well. I don't know why this one's reduced. 
So this uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God is found in Deuteronomy 8, 3. And one thing to remember, all three of these major temptations, the scripture that, G that our Lord quotes is from Deuteronomy. Let me read that passage, or the, it, I'll amplify on that passage. The, the Israelites had just spent their 40 years in, in the wilderness. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, and your foot did not swell up these 40 years. So what did they learn? God allowed Israel to get hungry in the wilderness, and why? So they would rely on him alone. Uh, this leads to you know, the, there's a great parallel. The, the people had to learn reliance on God in, in his judgment of them. And Jesus demonstrates his reliance on God in his willing submission. So that, that's a, a, a parallel there. And it leads to eternal benefits, not just earthly. So the devil changes his tactics and he tries to use scripture on Jesus. Then, then the devil took him to the holy city, which is Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And which temptation is this? This one's the pride of life. It's the... Um, playing on the, the attitude that you, any, if you've ever thought, man, I just live a charmed life. I really had, you know, in, in some sort of prideful way, you're thinking that everything, you know, just seems to work out for me. That's kind of this, this attitude that Satan's trying to foster. My dad said, like, used to say, like falling into a manure pit and coming out smelling like a rose. Um, and there's no surprise here that the, the, even the, uh, the scripture that Satan tried to use, he twisted its meaning, so, which is something he's always going to do. Notice that he stopped quoting at, at verse 12. We'll go back here. Lest you strike your foot against a stone. Verse 13, it goes on and says, You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. You can kind of understand why Satan didn't quote that part. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, Jesus goes back to Deuteronomy 8. Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. This is recalling the... Um, experience of the Israelites at, at Massah where they were demanding that Moses produce water. Remember that? And producing water in the desert was a, a recurring theme, but they were, they were putting uh, God to the test, angrily pr uh, demanding that Moses produce water where there was none. And that is also shown in Exodus 17 verses 2 to 7. Um, Next is, uh, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Did Satan have the ability to give this to him? He had temporary ability for sure. Um, remember in Daniel 10, uh, verse 13, Scripture says 
that demonic power controlled the kingdom of Persia at that time. And that a demon is called the prince of the kingdom of Persia. So Satan did have the power to follow through on that. But once again, Christ responds with, with scripture. Be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Notice that of all these, uh, these three temptations, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, life and this one was lust of the eyes. Uh, Jesus went back to Deuteronomy for his responses. And he described the experience of the Israelites in the wilderness. So his 40 days of temptation in the wilderness were to show that he got it right. He, he was tempted and did not sin, unlike the people of Israel. Then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So to sum up, God met fleshly needs according to his plan and timing. And Jesus was willing to let him. God certainly did command his angels concerning him and kept him safe. In what other place in, in, in scripture mentions God sending angels to comfort Jesus as well? Remember that? In the garden? And Jesus, of course, is the ultimate ruler of all. It's funny that Satan would offer to give him all these things when ultimately all these things are his. Moving on to Jesus begins his ministry. Verse 12, now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And if you remember, this, John was imprisoned for uh, rebuking Herod Antipas. Uh, you can see that, uh, you can read about that in Matthew 14, 3 to 4. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. Next, uh, Jesus leaves Nazareth. Why, why did Jesus leave? Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. So this is a fulfillment of scripture. Also, Jesus left because they tried to kill him. <laughs> Anybody remember this? We'll just go over that a little bit. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown, but in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who, who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue, were, and this is a synagogue in Nazareth, were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of a hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. And thus a prophecy was fulfilled. This uh, prophecy is actually taken from Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2. And you can also look at uh, Isaiah 42, 4 to 7 for, for illumination of that. Why do they call it Galilee of the Gentiles? Or why is it called Galilee of the Gentiles? Well, this name was used in, in Isaiah's time because Galilee lay on the route uh, through which most Gentiles passed in and out of Israel. Uh, in Jesus' time, the region of Galilee had become a pretty important center of, of, of uh, Roman occupation as well. From that time... Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is, is at hand. So this marks the beginning of his uh, public ministry. Notice that his message was an exact echo of what John the Baptist preached as well. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And again I say repent. Um, he began his ministry with the message of re repentance and set the tone of his entire earthly ministry. And in his closing charge to the apostles, he also commanded them to preach repentance as well. 
which is why we preach repentance. Uh, next, Jesus calls for his first disciples. And if you call the first two, two are, that he calls are Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They had actually met Jesus before in the area of Beth, Bethabara in the Jordan region. If you'll remember, this, Andrew, and perhaps Peter as well, had been a disciple of John the Baptist. We, we know for sure that, that Andrew was. And they left John to follow Jesus for, for a time before returning to their fishing in, in Capernaum. They may have returned to Capernaum during, during Jesus' early ministry, uh, described in Luke 4.23 and John 4.46-54, and also John 1.35-42. But here he called them to follow him in long-term discipleship. And as far as we know, they were never parted from him after that until the, uh, resurrect, or until the crucifixion. If you understand this well, it makes, understand, it makes it easier to understand the next verse. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left the nets and followed him. But this wasn't just a stranger. They knew, they knew who Jesus was. Matter of fact, I suppose they might have been wondering where Jesus was. And, and in effect, waiting for him. The next, two, uh, next disciples, James, and going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now let's, um, let's talk about James for a, a minute, because this is kind of a confusing thing. There are four Jameses in the New Testament. All right? First, there's a, the Apostle James, brother of John, which is the man we're talking about in this verse. There's James, the son of Alphaeus, who's also a disciple, um, and also was called James the Younger at times. Uh, there was James, the father of Judas, not Iscariot, but Judas was another disciple, and James was his father. And there was James, the Lord's half-brother, who ended up being a church leader and author of the epistle of James. So... It can get kind of confusing. <laughs> Zebedee. Have you ever heard the, the, the phrase sons of thunder as a description of, of James and John? When I was growing up, I thought that meant the Zebedee translated into thunder. <laughs> uh, it doesn't. I looked it up. <laughs> it actually means the gift of God. Uh, why do you think that James and John were, were called sons of thunder? It was, from all we know, it was, a, it was a nickname that the Lord gave them. But do you have any idea why he might have called them that? They were a little bit fiery sometimes and zealous. Remember, um, uh, at one time they, wanted, they asked Jesus if, if he wanted them to call down fire upon a, upon a village in Samaria because they wouldn't let them stay there, which that's what you call an escalation. <laughs> the disciple whom Jesus loved, the last disciple to die, in, in, uh, and he, he died of old age, was John. And Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So, his ministry was repentance, healing, and teaching. In the Sermon on the Mount, which uh, Ricardo will teach us uh, next week, um, we're going to learn attributes of the blessed. Uh, looking forward to that, Ricardo. Jesus also taught um, in parables, of course. And he used both in the Sermon on the Mount and as he traveled around. And parables were the way that Jesus communicated to his, his chosen people, the, the ones that have ears to hear. And he was proclaiming the gospel. And proclaiming the gospel here, he's talking about the fulfilling of prophecy, the good news, all of the things that God promised us in the Old Testament you get to see them happen right now. 
Remember Jesus would say, proclaiming in, in, in your hearing, after he'd get done reading the, the, the Scripture, the Old Testament in, in the synagogues, he would say, and today in your hearing, this has been fulfilled. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. What's this uh, Syria? What's, what's this mean? So today, Syria, Syria is a separate country with very defined borders, but in, in the time of, uh, of Jesus, uh, this was just known as the area that was immediately northeast of Galilee. And it took in a large, uh, large number of, of uh, places and cities. If you look at this, I don't know if you can see that map. It's really not large enough, but it, it basically just show, it's just showing this whole area up here is Syria. Oop, excuse me. Um, in Roman usage, Syria applied to virtually the whole of Palestine, with the exception of Galilee. A Galilean would probably have understood Syria to refer to the territory just north of Galilee from the Mediterranean to Damascus. And he healed them. So his ministry was teaching, proclaiming, and healing. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Anybody know what Decapolis is? I hadn't even thought about it until I was studying for this lesson. It's just a, um, a name for ten cities, Hellenized cities. Uh, Hellenized means Greek. Uh, south, south of Gal Galilee and mostly east of the Jordan, um, the League of Cities was formed shortly after Pompey's invasion of Palestine in 64 B.C. Uh, these cities were naturally Gentile strongholds. And this map shows up a little bit better. You can see all of the, the city names in kind of pink, purplish font there. And you can see where Galilee was in relation to them. And Nazareth there, Jesus' hometown. Just to give you an idea. In what ways were Jesus' temptations unique and, and not like ours? And why is that important? Any ideas? Well, one of the ways they were, were, were unique is he's only thinking about our re redemption and not his desires. In what way are Jesus' temptations just like ours? And what can we learn from his responses to Satan? Well, the general uh, verse found in in, in uh, in Second John, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, we all are tempted in exactly that way. Just about every temptation I can think of has fallen into one of those three categories. Um, well, I say just about every temptation I think, uh, I think about has fallen into one of those categories. And what do we learn from his response? This is an easy one. Come on. Go to Scripture. Always go to Scripture first. Not like last resort. Uh, and also helps to flee. Run. Get yourself out of that situation. If you were walking down the street in your community and asked people to summarize the message of Jesus in one sentence, what do you think they'd say? Love one another. Love one another. Love one another. That's, a, that's a very popular one. God is love. Um, especially here in America, we seem to have a, this attitude of... Uh, you remember the, the, the movie, um, what's the name of the movie with um, the Crocodile Dundee? Crocodile Dundee. Where somebody, I don't even remember the setup, but somehow somebody asked uh, um, Crocodile Dundee about God, and he very flippantly said, 
oh, me and God, we'd be mates. This, this attitude of, yeah, we're, we're, we're good. We're good. We're fine. Yeah. Does Jesus continue to heal today? Of course he does. Of course he does. I think probably everybody in this room, if you thought about it, would give an example of how Jesus healed you or somebody in your life, friend, family. Numerous examples, actually. Okay, next week, Ricardo's going to start the Sermon on the Mount. This is going to be some good stuff. Uh, and they'll be doing part one. This is the Sermon on the Mount itself is going to be broken up into four parts. So, and he'll be doing he'll be preach, uh, teaching from Matthew five verses one through twenty. If you want want to uh, uh, study up for that, <laughs> only twenty verses. Yeah, I heard that before. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. We ask that uh, you would, your Holy Spirit would help us apply this in our life and that we would meditate and ponder on your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm-hmm.